This Airbus A320-214 was built for the US Airways in 1999. The A320 is a modern airliner that was one of the first airliners to incorporate state-of-the-art fly-by-wire technology and composite construction in some of the structural components. The aircraft is widely used by air carriers all over the world. On January 15, 2009, at approximately 3.27 p.m., U.S. Airways Flight 1549 departed LaGuardia Airport, heading to Charlotte Douglas International Airport. Want to know about it? Well, stay tuned to the video and watch the video till the end. Hello guys, welcome to Mayday Investigation. Hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications to get new updates about plane crashes and basically anything around air crash investigation. Hit the like button to show your support. And in this video, we are going to talk about the US Airways Flight 1549. So without any further ado, let's begin. Less than two minutes after takeoff, the captain told the control tower there was an emergency. The cause of the crash was that shortly after takeoff, the plane hit a flock of what proved to be Canada geese destroying the engines. Remains of bird strikes in the United States are generally sent to the ornithology department at the Smithsonian Institution for identification using feathers and DNA sequences. Vix identified the species, but a friend and colleague, Dr. Peter Mara, from the Smithsonian's Migratory Bird Center, wanted to determine if these birds were local Canada geese from the New York area or migratory geese spending the winter in the New York region. Something these techniques could not determine. First Officer Skiles was in the right seat, flying the airplane. Captain Sullenberger was in the left seat, working the radio and tending to chores, climbing out of 700 feet and accelerating to about 230 miles an hour. They checked in with New York departure control and were identified on radar and cleared to 15,000 feet. About a minute later, they came upon the birds. Skill saw them first. They appeared in a line formation ahead, above and to the right, and gave him barely time to comment before. In Sullenberger's recollection, they seem to fill the windscreen. An Airbus A320 on departure weighs more than 150,000 pounds. It is agile for its size and has an extremely smart design, but it can no more defy physics than any other airplane can. Skiles had no chance to maneuver. The most immediate priority was to secure the aircraft and prevent it from interfering with river traffic. As such, authorities took it four miles downstream and secured it by tying it up near Battery Park City in Lower Manhattan. The aircraft was still partially underwater at this point and leaning to its left-hand side. None of the 150 passengers, three flight attendants, and two pilots lost their life due to the crash. Flight attendant Doreen Welsh sustained a severe injury to her leg, which was gashed by a metal bar that pushed through the cabin floor. She never returned to flying after that date, but has written and talked about her experience. According to the NTSB, four passengers were also seriously injured, meaning they were hospitalized for more than 48 hours. Dozens more were treated for minor injuries as well as hypothermia. The air temperature that day was a brutal 19 degrees Fahrenheit, and the water temperature was 41 degrees. There were no fatalities from the crash itself, from hypothermia, or from drowning, which are all certainly possible outcomes for a water landing in New York City in January. His co-pilot has said that another consideration in choosing the river was to ensure that passengers would be rescued quickly, thanks to the proximity of many ferry boats. Passengers were also aided by other passengers, thanks to clear instructions from the crew. U.S. Airways faced an immense amount of questions from the reporters and family members. Some of the passengers felt horrified by the shocking experience. Their family members, stunned by the news coverage, were worried about their well-being and eager to get in touch with them or reunite with them. Some passengers wanted to get to their planned destinations but worried about flight safety and preferred to travel by land. The passengers' belongings, such as wallets, cell phones, computers, and luggage, were still in the partly submerged plane. Later, a few passengers contacted law firms to consult about suing for emotional distress and other losses. From the moment after the landing, survivors have been interviewed by the media. Some immediately after being pulled from the wings of the floating plane, there was also an instant social media frenzy about the event. 
Meanwhile, National Transportation Safety Board started to conduct an investigation into the incident. Under these circumstances, any response action by the airline would be under close public scrutiny. What a view of the Hudson today! The captain, Chesley Sully Sullenberger III, exclaimed as the crew completed their after takeoff checklist. Yeah, his co pilot, First Officer Jeffrey Skiles, agreed while flying the jet. Birds! The captain yelled. With no time to react or avoid, the aircraft investigated several 12 pound waterfowl into both engines. Whoa! Oh shit! The co pilot exclaimed. Geese hit the windshield nose and wings in rapid succession like pelting hail. It sounded like it was raining birds, the captain recalled. They filled the windscreen, large dark birds, like a black and white photograph. Having secured the aircraft in place, the next step was to safely remove it from the river. According to the BBC, this took place on January 18th, three days after the ditching using a crane. That night, NBC reported that the aircraft's largely intact remains had then been loaded into a barge. This vessel then took the plane to New Jersey for examination. This looked at all piloting and technical aspects of the incident and ditching and made several recommendations for improvements. Ultimately, it was determined that the probable cause was the ingestion of large birds into each engine, which resulted in an almost total loss of thrust in both engines. Company CEO Doug Parker made a statement before flying to New York from the company headquarters in Arizona and appeared in a joint news conference on January 16th with city officials to honor the crew and first responders. U.S. Airways activated a special 800 number for families to call and dispatched more than 100 employees as the care team on a Boeing 757 from headquarters. Scott Stewart, Managing Director for Corporate Finance, managed emergency funding for passengers and credit cards for employees to buy any medicines, toiletries, or personal items that passengers needed. They were extensive flight simulator reenactments of the flight. These focused on the possibility of returning to LaGuardia or diverting to Teterboro. An important issue here was pilot reaction and consideration time. Simulations with an immediate turn to an airport were partly successful, but not so when a reaction delay was added. The investigation concluded that Sullenberger's decision was correct. Starting at APU early provided vital in the later stages of the ditching, as it maintained power for all systems. Sullen Gerber did this immediately, whereas it was a later task in the checklist for dual engine failure. Passengers were provided dry clothes, warm meals, and prepaid cell phones, as well as flights for family members and daily calls from counselors. Staffers escorted each passenger to a new flight or a local New York hotel. They also arranged train tickets and rental cars for those who didn't want to fly. As some people lost their driver's licenses, US Airways reached out to high-level executives at Hertz and Amtrak to make sure they had no trouble getting a rental or a train ticket. Although some passengers and the National Air Disaster Alliance and Foundation considered the amount not high enough, US Airways indicated it employed claims adjusters to compensate passengers whose losses were higher than $5,000. The company didn't require passengers to receive compensation to waive their legal rights, which was seen as an exemption to the industry norm. The company also sent follow-up letters offering the service of the customer care team and information on the retrieval of their belongings. Indeed, two years later, in 2011, the Carolinas Aviation Museum purchased its remains from the New Jersey Salvage Yard that was its previous storage location. The museum was in Charlotte, the destination of US Airways Flight 1549. For now, the general public cannot see the aircraft, which has since had its engines reattached. This is due to the fact that, in 2019, the museum temporarily closed ahead of a move to a new location. Its exhibits, including N-106 US, are now in storage. Warbird Digest reports that they will be back on show at the newly relocated museum in 2023. I am forever indebted to Captain Sully and the crew of US Airways Flight 1549 for my second chance at life and, for 13 years, I have been determined to find a way to honor them," said crash survivors Rick Elias, who is the CEO and co-founder of media conglomerate Red Ventures. Now that we've come to the end of this video, I want to thank you for sticking with me and I'd love to know what you think of it. 
just comment down below. Also, if you like this video, make sure you like it and stay safe. Today's video is over, but if you want to see more, there's one on your screen right now, and there's a few more videos coming soon about air crash investigation. I'll see you in the next video.